Thanks for having me. I see some familiar faces out there, some new faces as well. Um, one of the things I like to go over when I, when I do these things are new, uh, new case holdings and things like that, um, because that's what uh, kind of forms the, the law that we all have to, have to um, you know, live by it and deal with when we're you know, selling real estate. There haven't been a lot of reported cases in the last couple of years, uh, which is you know, generally a good thing. Uh, because a lot of the cases that are out there are pretty broker friendly. One of the cases, though, that has come out in the recent years actually um, involved this area, Palos Verdes and, and uh, the South Bay area. Uh, some of you may have heard of it. Many of you probably have not, but we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit today. But it involves something called imputed knowledge, and that's why these words are up on the screen today. Um, imputed knowledge is, Andy, there it is. What is it? It's information that the law deems that you have, even if you don't actually have it. I don't have my clicker today, so I've got to use Andy's Andy mic. Andy. 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 Yeah. 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 Right. Um, <laughs> just bang on the head. Exactly. <laughs> um, everybody's heard the uh, the old adage, the old expression, "Ignorance of the law is no excuse." And um, I hope you have. It, you know, come, come see me. Uh, but if you have, that's basically what imputed knowledge is is talking about. Um, it applies to what's what we know as a, the black letter law, the law that's actually written down in the books. You know, if you pulled open a, a code book and looked at it, or the you know the code of civil procedure, or the business and professional codes, all the different things that apply to you guys, you are deemed to have knowledge of those, even if you have never read a word of it. Which, in fact, you know probably many of you have not. You've learned it through classes and through uh, getting your license and stuff like that. But you probably haven't sat down and actually read the law. It doesn't matter. You're deemed to have knowledge of all this. Everybody in this room is deemed to have knowledge and deemed to know every bit of written law that is of record in California. And the same goes with case law. And case law is basically how judges interpret the black letter law. The legislature writes something down, puts it into the code book. There may be a question as to how it's to be interpreted. That's what case law is. So you've got to know this stuff. And, and a good, here's some examples. Uh, Code of Civil Procedure, I'm sorry, uh, Civil Code Section 1102. Everybody knows what that is, right? Uh, you get a delivery, uh, seller has to deliver a TDS to the buyer. Uh, Civil Code Section 2079, everybody knows that one, right? You gotta do a, a reasonably diligent visual inspection. If you don't know these two, by the way, go talk to Jim immediately and then, you know, uh, he and I will have a talk, but you, you definitely need to know, <laughs> definitely need to know these two. This is one, I put this up here, it's called 1695 and 2945 because they are almost equally as important as these two and yet very few people know what they are. Has anybody heard of the Home Equity Sales Contracts Act? If you have, raise your hand. Jim has, there you go. Um, not a lot of people know about it. Um, it's a very dangerous law, and it goes hand in hand with this 2945, which is called the Mortgage Foreclosure Consultants Act. Um, both of these get a lot of play these days because of the amount of short sales and foreclosures that are out there, and a lot of properties that have recorded uh, notices of default and things like that. Um, and they have a lot of real tricky sections on how you, you know, when when do these laws come into play? What do you have to do to comply with them? And then what are the penalties if you don't comply with them? And some of the penalties, especially in this one, 1695, are pretty bad. Um, things like treble damages. In other words, you, you know, the court establishes a damage and they multiply it by three. There's a, 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 an optional prison sentence of you know, up to a year. There's $10,000 fines here, $20,000 fines there. So, you, you got to know this stuff even because, again, the law applies and you know it even if you don't. So, um, you know, one of the things you definitely want to do is make sure you're aware of the stuff that applies to you when you get into a certain situation. And if you're getting into a new type of sale, something you haven't done before, if you haven't done a short sale, if you've never dealt with an REO property before, if you've never dealt with a seller who's in foreclosure before, go and talk to Jim. Uh, because you know there are certain things that are going to be different in those situations than the normal uh, conventional sale. And whether you know it or not, it's going to apply to you. Um, I had the, the sort of displeasure of, of litigating on the defense side a case involving 1695 way back in like 2003 
well before you know the foreclosure crisis hit and all that. I mean, this was still during uh, the good years, and the, it, it was an issue in that case. And, and um, one of the you know things that we always tell you guys is when there's any kind of a um, a novel situation that pops up during the escrow, tell the buyer, tell the seller to go see a attorney. Exactly. It's exactly what happened in this case. The attorney takes a look at the deal and says, looks good to me. Turns out there was a horrendous 1695 violation, uh, $800,000 worth of damages when you tacked up everything you know, together with the, 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 the trebling of the damages and the fines and this, that, and the other. And uh, you know, it was one of those things where they went and saw an attorney, and the attorney didn't even know what this, uh, what this thing was. It didn't matter. Uh, everybody was held accountable as though they had full knowledge of it. So again, when you're getting into a new area that you're not familiar with, then talk about it, get some information on it, because you know, saying, oh, I didn't know, isn't going to be an excuse. Uh, Andy, let's go to the next one. Okay. This is one uh, that I like to talk about as well. Uh, so ignorance of your partners is no excuse uh, either. Do you guys operate in teams? Do you do that in San Diego? We do that a lot. Okay. Um, if your partners are ignorant, is that? <laughs> that, that? That's actually a good point. If your partners are ignorant, well, uh, that's uh, good for you. You're, uh, it's, always, it's always good to be the smart one in partnership. Um, but uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that these, the teams uh, are considered partnerships uh, under California law. Um, let me read this to you. Uh, each of the members of a joint venture and the joint venture itself are responsible for the wrongful conduct of a member acting in furtherance of the venture. All right, let's go to the next one. Okay, so what qualifies as a joint venture? Two or more persons or business entities combine their property, skill, or knowledge with the intent to carry out a single business undertaking. Go to the next one. Each has an ownership interest in the business. They have joint control over the business, even if they agree to delegate that control, and they agree to share the profits and losses of the business. Okay, look to the next one. Oh, a joint venture can be formed by a written or an oral agreement. So just because you don't have a written agreement with your team members or whatever doesn't mean that the rest of these things don't apply to you. And what I've just read to you is KC 3712. Anybody know what a KC is? Probably not. KC is a jury instruction. It's what basically tells the judge what the law is in any given situation. So that's basically the law of California. And when you apply it to people that are getting together in teams to market properties, make money, so on and so forth, you begin to realize that you know the, the team that you're associated with is really a joint venture. It's, a, it's a, like a partnership. Uh, so why is this important? Well, uh, it's important for a number of reasons. One is the vicarious liability, the imputed knowledge that we've just talked about. Oh, all right, anyway, we'll go past that. Um, so disputes between members of the joint venture. A good example of this is, um, well, I can give you a good example of it because I, I just dealt with it. Uh, two agents in a brokerage that I represent had a dispute. They were members of a team. They came to the brokerage as a team. And their uh, deal was they split everything 50-50. So it didn't matter. One had a listing. Uh, one brought in a buyer. It didn't matter. Whatever it was, every, at the end of the day, everything was tallied up and it was split 50-50. Well, um, after a few months, one of the partners uh, began to think, this is kind of lopsided because I'm doing all the work. I'm getting all the listings. I'm bringing in all the buyers. Uh, my partner is... Uh, he's just gotten married, he's on, uh, I guess what we call love leave, he's always in Colorado looking for his, uh, his new home, and you know, I'm doing all the damn work on this thing. So he gets in a pretty big listing, um, gets, a, gets a buyer for it, goes into escrow, and says, you know what, That's, this is it, I'm done, I'm not sharing this commission with you. This was a big commission, it was like, you know, a $60,000 commission. And he said, yeah, I'm just not, I'm not giving you $30,000 of that, you haven't been here, your head's on in the game. You know we're done, and uh, the other guy said, "No, we're, we're not. I mean, our partnership is that we split everything 50-50. If you want to end the partnership, you know, there's nothing I can do about that. But you know, the partnership ends today, and the listing came in, you know, before today. So you owe me thirty thousand uh, dollars. So the guy came to me and said, "What do I do?" And I said, "I, I think you, you pay him thirty thousand dollars. I mean, you know, I, I, either that or you're you're going to have to duke it out, you know, in, in court." But 
if your um, actions have been that you've been sharing the the, the you know the, the spoils 50-50, uh, that's what the law is going to imply your partnership is unless you have a written agreement that says otherwise. So um, have a written agreement. If you don't, the law is basically any judge that's looking at this is going to look back and say, well, if you guys can't agree on what the terms of your partnership is, let's see how you've acted in the past and we'll just imply the terms from that. So uh, not a bad idea to have a written agreement with whoever you're partnering up with, doing business with, because if you don't, it's you know kind of a crapshoot as to what uh, the terms will be if you have a disagreement, right? Um, but now let's talk about third-party claims. Those are not members of the you know the team, the partnership that are having issues. It's other people that are having issues with a member of the team or the team itself. So <clears throat> if you are teamed up and the law considers that to be a joint venture or a partnership, and one of the members of the team is sued for negligence. You know, you didn't do a, a good job on your uh, inspection. You didn't uh, advise the seller, uh, you know, well enough on how to disclose things, so on and so forth. They think you committed, or one member of the team committed outright fraud. You know, you knew about something that was significant with the property, and you, you know, you deep sixed it. You tried not to disclose it. You hid it someplace. Um, if one member of the team is sued, the team can be sued, and all the other team members can be sued as well. So think about that. If you've got a team, make sure you know. Uh, pretty well the personalities of the people that you're teaming up with because you could ultimately be held liable for whatever they do if they get sued you know you, you could be brought into that as well um, I put insurance coverage here because if you know the team member is sued because they were involved in the transaction um, they did something or didn't do something whatever that got them sued um, that's fine that's what insurance coverage covers uh, if you look at the activating clause in any E and O policy, it will say we will insure you when you do something that requires a license, and you know you get sued for it. Um, probably doesn't apply though if you're just a member of the team, a member of the partnership who gets dragged in under this vicarious liability. So you know the insurance coverage may not cover you because you didn't do anything that required a license. You just got brought in because of this partnership, and the coverage probably won't apply to you. So you might be out there defending yourself uh, on those issues. Um, DRE issues has nothing to do with this vicarious liability stuff that we're talking about. I throw it in there only because I talk about it every time I talk about it with teams. Uh, the DRE actually says that every team has to be a registered DBA with the Department of Real Estate. And if it's not, it's a BNP code violation. So. Again, it doesn't have much to do with vicarious liability, but I always throw it out there because not a lot of people know about it. So if you're operating as a team, um, it's best to try to get that team registered uh, with the DRE. If you don't, you, know, you could get a letter from uh, a deputy commissioner. Um, joint and several liability. That is the, the principle of this. If you have two members of a team and the team gets sued because of something one team member did, Everybody is jointly and severally liable if you're a member of this joint venture, partnership, whatever it is. So the fact that your partner may not be able to satisfy a judgment uh, that is you know, rendered against him or rendered against the team is irrelevant. They can, a, a plaintiff who gets a judgment against a group of people can collect that whole judgment against any single one of those people. Um, even though it may be a portion, yes, uh, how do you how do you see that apply uh, if it's a co-listing with somebody outside of the office? Uh, if it's a co-listing, uh, I've, I've actually had this case. If it's a co-listing with another brokerage, and there's a lawsuit, and that other brokerage did something wrong, um, you know, didn't disclose a previous report. That was the case that that my brokerage was involved with. They were co-listing with another brokerage. That brokerage had a copy of a report from a previous escrow and didn't disclose it. And obviously that report was quite a bit more telling than the information that actually made its way to the buyer. Um, the case was settled. If it had not been settled, um, if that brokerage were found guilty and our brokerage were found guilty as well, the plaintiff could choose to pick and choose who they wanted to um, get their judgment from. If they got a million dollar judgment, they could collect Half a million from us, half a million from the other. A dollar from us, nine hundred ninety-nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine dollars from somebody else. It's 
It's up to the plaintiff as to what who they want to collect from, in what proportion, and what does that mean? I mean, that basically means they go to who has the money. If you know, if one brokerage has a big insurance policy, they'll go hit that. If the other has big assets, they'll you know they'll collect from that. But any time you are linked up with somebody else and there's an accusation that you jointly committed a tort, negligence, fraud, something like that, you're both jointly and severally liable. Okay, let's go to the next one. All right, uh, <coughs> any, any questions on that? By the way, because we're about to move into another another area. Oh, okay, several questions. You had your hand up first, so go ahead. If you're working with a realtor in your office and you decide to just refer them on a huge referral fee, you know, for 75 percent referral fee, for instance, are you, are you now not part of that joint several liability? Or? Uh, probably not. Um, and, and the reason for that is because you're not combining your efforts to, to do something. You're not coming together in a joint venture. You're just basically referring something over to somebody else. The expectation at that point is you're not going to be involved in that sale, listing, whatever it is. So you're not combining your efforts for the uh, purpose of making a profit. So no, that really wouldn't be a partnership or, or a joint venture. Um, nor would there be any joint and several liability because again, to get joint and several liability, it has to be two like joint tort feasors doing something uh, that you know combines to cause a harm. In this case, no, uh, you have no involvement in the file other than simply you know uh, making the recommendation over to somebody else. So no, that would be that would be pretty safe. There was another hand over here. Yes. How would a lot of developers be able to do an LLC? Yeah, those those are, are good ideas. Uh, partnership agreements, LLCs, that kind of stuff are, are good if you are going to get involved with somebody else yeah, as, as partners. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know, um, well, not that it matters, but uh, if, if you were going to do business as an LLC, I'm not sure how that works with the Department of Real Estate. I think they'll register an LLC, but I'm not entirely, not entirely correct on that one. Okay. So uh, we'll move past that and now into the imputation of material facts, and that's the, uh, I believe this is pronounced Michelle versus Palos Verdes Network, a uh, case that came down a couple of years ago, and it has to do with imputed knowledge. Um, so different from what we're talking about, not the imputation that everybody knows the laws of California or that you know what's in the head of your partners or that you're responsible for your, your team members or things like that. This is a little bit different. Um, so, what Michelle versus Palos Verdes Network Group stands for is this premise that the knowledge of all the agents or even just the employees of the brokerage are imputed to the broker. So, so what does that mean? Um, let's go to the next slide. Yeah, all right, never mind. <laughs> that was the slide I wanted. All right, here's here's what it here's what it basically stands for is um, any information that is in the broker's file is considered to be information that you guys have. So how does how do we apply that? Well, we apply it this way. Um, if you've got a listing, uh, or if you're involved in a buy, bringing in the, the buyer on the selling side of it, um, what you want to do is check and see whether or not that property has ever run through this brokerage before. Because if it has, the knowledge, everything that's contained in that past file is considered to be knowledge that you have. Um, that may sound confusing, so let me give you an example. Uh, you know, in, in 2005, you have an agent in South Bay that lists this property for sale, and there's disclosures that are made. Those disclosures are put in the file, the transaction closes, years go by, the property comes up for sale again. It doesn't matter if it's listed with South Bay or it's not listed with South Bay. Let's just assume South Bay's involvement is that they bring the buyer in. Let's say it's listed with a completely different brokerage. Well, any information that's in the South Bay's file from that 2005 transaction is considered to be knowledge that, that you have. So if you're the selling agent, you bring in the buyer on that, and there's a disclosure that was made in 2005 that doesn't get made in this one, you're going to be held liable for that. So what do you have to do? Well, uh, obviously, and I've talked to Jim about this, I know 
um, that you guys are a rarity in the, uh, in the field because you actually do check for that kind of stuff. When a listing comes in or a sale comes in, you guys do kind of run it through the, the brokerage database and find out, were we involved with this? If we were involved, do we still have the file? Let's pull the file and see what the disclosures say. That's, that's incredibly good practice and it's something that, that not, I don't believe, any other brokerage is doing. Um, maybe Prudential is doing it. I don't know they say they are. I don't know if they are or not, but um, it, it's, it's good practice. But here's, a, here's another good practice. Um, when you take a listing, for example, or if you're bringing in the buyer, look it up in the MLS and see when the last time, if, if at all, it was involved. You know, if, if you can pull it up on the MLS and say, oh yeah, you know, five years ago, uh, so-and-so was involved in this file, see whether or not that person, the, the, the agents that are involved in that transaction, are currently associated with South Bay. If they are, again, it's the knowledge of all the agents currently associated. So even if the agent wasn't with South Bay at the time they did the transaction in the past, if they're with South Bay now, their knowledge is imputed to the brokerage. So if you can take a look at the MLS and say, you know, Bob was involved with this transaction in 2005 and now Bob is an agent here. Well, maybe it makes sense to, to contact Bob and say, I've got the listing or I'm bringing in a sale on this property. You know, do you remember anything about it? Was there anything significant about the uh, transaction that you can tell me about? Are there any disclosures that we should know about on this property? You know, odds are the answer is going to be, you know, no, I don't remember, I don't have the file, something like that. But it's still not a bad idea to check. Yes? Well, just briefly, how far back? 20, 30, 40 years? There's, there's no standard on that. There's absolutely no standard. If you don't have the file, how, are you, I mean, how long do you keep the file? If, if you don't have the file, um, there's not much you can do. I mean, if you, if most brokerages keep the files, I would say, between like five and, and seven years. And, and the reason for that is just uh, purely actuarial. I mean, I used to work for an insurance company, so we used to track the data on this stuff. And most claims that occur, occur about 12 to 18 months after the close of escrow. So you see about 85 to 90% of your claims in that time frame. So if you can, you know, put an X on the uh, calendar and say, uh, it's been a year since I closed that transaction, the odds of you getting sued on that start going, uh, going down dramatically. Um, when you hit the 18 month period, the odds of you getting sued on that are pretty slim. Um, once it goes past five years, the odds of you getting sued on that are almost zero. I, I can think of maybe one or two claims that I've defended in my 16 years of doing this that have been on transactions older than five years. So for the most part, you know, brokerages keep their files about five years, and, and that's pretty safe. Um, if you don't have the file anymore, there's not much that you can disclose from that file. Um, I will tell you, I've been involved in a couple of cases where, where that's been the case, where, where I've, I've had the brokerage, the broker just said, yeah, it was, it's been more than three years, we destroyed our file. Okay, you know, that's fine. You can't really disclose something if it's not in your file. The problem is the file always pops up someplace else. Um, and it, yeah, the, I, got, uh, I got involved in a case up in the Bay Area um, in which the seller from the previous transaction was, um, uh, she was a, like the, you know, she had something to do with Star Wars, so she had Star Wars money. Um, so every transaction she'd ever done was handled through this, you know, huge Bay Area law firm. And a simple subpoena to that law firm brought out a file that was, you know, 10 years old and a series of disclosures that were, you know, in that file. So then, then you're, you're kind of caught in a battle because the file is there and the disclosures are there and then the question becomes, well, what could you have done to have, to have retrieved that file? Um, if you don't have it, it, it makes it more difficult. But, uh, I mean, again, I think Jim's policy is what? Uh, five years, six seven. years on record retention? Seven. Seven. seven, okay. Yeah, seven years on record retention is, is, is pretty safe. You're, you're not, you're not going to get sued on many cases that are older than seven years. Um, so, imputed knowledge. Um, it's, it's one of these things that has been, you know, it's been alive for a while, but we're starting to see more and more um, inroads to it. You know, there, there was a time when you didn't really see any cases on imputed knowledge for a long time. There was one, I think, back in the 80s. Um, and there really wasn't a lot of 
um, movement in this field for a long time, and now there's starting to be more movement in it. So one of the questions that you know we on the sort of defense side of this have been saying is, why is that? You know, why why are we starting to see courts looking at issues related to brokerages and retention of files and going back into old files and talking to former agents and things like that. And the, the answer seems to be this. It seems to be that the market is largely being made up of short sales and REOs. Is that is that the case with you guys? Do you see a lot of, of REO listings? About 30%. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a fairly decent chunk of the market. In San Diego, I think it's actually more. I mean, if you added up short sales and REOs, it's probably the majority of our market. And that scares the courts. Um, any, any idea why? Take a guess. Yeah, there's no seller. I mean, there's a seller, but you know, in a short sale, you've got a seller who's basically checked out. I mean, they don't really care about the property. Sometimes, you know, they're not even living there anymore. They haven't had anything to do with it for years. Um, disclosure to an investor buyer or you know whatever to any kind of buyer that's coming in is 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 sometimes the last thing on their minds. In fact, sometimes they're actually sort of malicious about it and say, you know, aha, you're going to get a great deal on my house, but you know, you don't know about all the problems that it has. You know, wait, you know, wait and see what you've got to deal with. Uh, or you've got an REO uh, seller that you know that either has no knowledge of it or you know of, of anything to do with the property um, or thinks that they don't have any type of disclosure obligation. So the courts are looking at this now and they're saying, well, this is scary because disclosure is a big thing. We, we want buyers to have as much disclosure as possible in these, law, in these uh, transactions, but we don't have a good source of that if you've got REO sellers and checked out short sale sellers. So they're starting to pay more attention to what the real estate brokerages and agents do. And they're starting to place more and more emphasis on what you guys do, what you disclose, so on and so forth. Um, this Michelle versus Palos Verdes case, while it involved the issue of uh, imputed knowledge and material facts, went into great detail to talk about the fiduciary duties that are owed from a real estate brokerage to a buyer, how those fiduciary duties are fleshed out and played out, the importance of them, so on and so forth. So think about that as, you, as you're going forward, that you know, the, the eyes of the, uh, of the court are kind of on you right now because they see you as, as really the gatekeepers of disclosure. And for a long time, you know, we used to preach, no, it's the, it's the seller who's the gatekeeper. It's the seller that knows everything about the property. Well, the courts are looking at it different, yeah. Um, <coughs> networking groups have become very popular lately. A lot of us are here. That says networking groups. How does that relate to the case? Uh, that's just the name of the brokerage. Oh, that's the name of the brokerage. Oh, right. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was just the name of the brokerage that was the <coughs> one of the defendants in the lawsuit. Yes. What was the particular problem with this? Did they not disclose the foundation issue or something defective? Uh, something defective with the house? Uh, yes, to both. Uh, it was it was kind of a weird set of facts, actually. Um, the well, uh, here's how it starts out. There's a, a new agent, and he's you know, he's got his license, and he's you know hot to trot to get a uh, uh, a listing. So he goes to his friend's parents, who have a house in Palos Verdes. Says, uh, I guess they're interested in selling. I don't know. So anyway, he goes there, and he try he pitches himself, and tries to get the listing. And as he's there, he's walking through the house, and he's making all these notes of all the uh, you know the things that are wrong with the house. You know, good good thing to do. Uh, that I guess that's fresh in his mind. He's just come off of the training courses to get the license, uh, and he makes some pretty serious notes because this place is kind of, uh, it's kind of a mess. Uh, a lot of deferred maintenance, a lot of cracks, a lot of um, uh, um, termite damage, a lot of, you know, a lot of issues. Uh, he ends up not getting the listing. They give it to uh, an agent at Fred Sands. Uh, so flash forward several months, uh, the guy that, that, you know, the, the sort of the star of the show here, um, is no longer uh, trying to be a sales agent. He's now trying his hand at being a transaction coordinator, and he works for uh, Larry Moore and Associates. Um, and the Larry Moore ends up bringing in the buyer, and he is not—he's not the uh, the agent on this. He's again, he's the transaction coordinator on all this. Well, in the months that have gone by since he first went there with his patent paper and noted all this stuff down, the sellers, uh, the owners did uh, some uh, cover-up. You know, they painted over some cracks, they, uh, you know, repaired some uh, some drywall damage, repaired some termite damage, so on and so forth. And the house looks 
very different than it did when he saw it. So the buyers, the Michelles, uh, purchase this place with Larry Moore as their agent. Um, the agents actually go through and do a pretty decent job on their visual inspection checklist. I mean, you know, based on what they could see. Uh, the transaction closes without too much of a hitch. Several months later, the cracks that have been painted over, of course, start to show again. They get wider, the paint starts to peel off, so on and so forth. Um, the Michelles supposedly uh, retain a geotechnical expert who says, yeah, the reason this is happening is because you're on unstable soil. And um, you know, if you look at the damage profiles here, all this stuff would have been visible to you had it not been for you know, the obvious cover-up uh, that was done, the, the painting over of all this damage. So they, they, get a little bit, uh, they get a little bit concerned, and they sue, of course, and they send a subpoena to Larry Moore and Associates because that was their broker. And as part of the file uh, that gets turned over are the notes that our hero, the transaction coordinator slash whatever he is, sales agent, well, you know, uh, that he made. And so, of course, the plaintiff's attorney is looking at this and saying, wow, we never saw these during the transaction, and yet they were in Larry Moore's file. Um, and that information obviously was, you know, imputed to the brokerage. And what went from a case that was a summary judgment case, in other words, um, the judge, you know, looks at the case and says, not enough to go to the jury, no, no question of fact here, we can rule on it as law, kicks the case out. The, uh, let's see, this would be up here, second appellate district said, uh, no, it's got to go, got to go before a jury. There's a, there's a non-disclosure uh, obligation here, and uh, it's got to go to the jury. So that that was the facts of this case, but that kind of tells you that you know whatever it is that winds up in the, the hands, the heads, whatever of people that are associated with the brokerage is considered the broker and the agent, uh, broker and the agent's knowledge. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I was following you. They got paid for a moment there. Uh, when uh, Larry Moore uh, his associates gave him the file, did that make that uh, case weaker? Stronger. It like, uh, well, it made the plaintiff's case a lot stronger. It, it actually brought Larry Moore and Associates in as, as defendants in the case. Yeah. So, exactly. yeah, weaker for, weaker for the broker. Yeah, and I, you know, why, how those notes got found and produced and put in the production, we'll never know, but they did. And, uh, and that, was, that, was not, that was not a good day. All right, so, um, so seeing as how we have, we have this to deal with, and seeing as how we have courts that are now beginning to take a look at brokerages and disclosures and things like that, what do, what do we do to, you know, to stay out of trouble? Um, Andy? All right, well, first of all, you know, know the law. Uh, know who you're dealing with, know your partners. Uh, know the information that's in your broker's file. Uh, Laws are going to assume that you already do. Let's go to the next one. Okay, what can we do? All right, look around. Um, some of you that were here last year when, when I did this presentation will remember some of this. And the reason that I'm emphasizing it again today is because this is still true. Um, you know, when the financial crisis and the foreclosure crisis began to hit, um, we on the defense side were sort of postulating as what would brokers get sued for now. Everybody thought it was going to be things like uh, you know, deficiency judgments on short sales and um, stuff like that. And, you know, we were all sort of bracing for this new wave of, of lawsuits that would be created you know, out of this financial crisis. And, and really, none of it ever happened. Um, of the files that I'm defending right now, they're all pretty much non-disclosure of a material fact. So you kind of look back on where the market's been over the last couple of years, and people are still suing over the same thing. You know, deed restriction wasn't disclosed to me. Um, the condition of the house is bad. There's a geotechnical landslide movement issue on the slope. I mean, those are the those are the cases that I'm dealing with now. Virtually none of them have anything to do with all of these, you know, boogeyman type things that we were worried about. You know, these new things that we thought would pop up out of the uh, you know the REO and foreclosure crisis. So. It really is back to this. You got to look around. I mean, that's what you're going to get sued for if you're going to get sued for anything is non-disclosure of a material fact, a defect at the house. So when you're going through the house, look around. It doesn't matter if you're listing, 
the property for sale, or if you're representing the buyer, look for the red flags. Uh, you know, check it out. Um, yeah, exactly. Most lawsuits stem from a failure to disclose. Most of these things start in the ceiling, or they start in the foundation. That's you know pretty much 90% of the stuff that we see is either a problem that starts with a leaky roof, a water intrusion problem, or it starts in the floor with uh, a foundation issue, a foundation crack. So those are the kind of the two things that you're gonna you're gonna want to look for. Ceiling stains, uh, always uh, a good telltale sign of an issue. Always something to look for. Always something to red flag and address. Um, patched drywall, bubbling paint, fresh paint. That's always another one as well. Um, can't tell you how many cases that I've been involved in where the you know, primary allegation against the broker is you should have known that this, uh, this place is completely covered up because look, all the fresh paint everywhere. Um, well, I mean, to a certain extent, if you see that the house has been you know, freshened up a bit, um, you know, as a listing broker, what do you do with that? We, you know, you, you can't really do much, uh, you can't disclose something you don't see as a listing broker. But as a selling broker, a selling agent who represents a buyer, you know, if you see a property that's got a lot of new fresh paint, um, it's time to ask some questions. Uh, ask some questions of the seller. Uh, okay, so you, know, you painted the house, it looks really nice. Um, were there any cracks? You know, uh, was there anything that was painted over? You know, things like that. Ask, ask questions, address those things. Um, you know, if you address them, ask the questions, and the answer comes back, no, we didn't paint over any cracks, great, that's fine. Even if it's not true, at least you've done your job, you've discharged your fiduciary duty by asking the question and getting the answer. Any? <coughs> Just go through all of them. Nope, let's go back. So these are good questions to ask, um, definitely if you are a listing agent. Um, but also if you're the selling agent. Um, one of the, the, the primary things that we, we deal with um, on the listing side of things are sellers saying, well, I didn't know I was supposed to disclose that. You didn't tell me I was supposed to disclose that. Um, so when you see ceiling stains, you know, one of the things to ask is, have you had leaks? Um, you know, what, 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 you know, what's the source of these ceiling stains? Um, when's the last time you know you took a look at this? You know, was, uh, did this thing leak? You know, during the last rain? Um, ask about recent repairs. If you see evidence of you know drywall patching, paint, stuff like that, ask questions. Why was it done? When was it done? Would you uh, make a note <coughs> make a notation of those questions on your habit? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Whenever you're going to ask a question and whenever you get an answer back, it should always be in, what, in writing, of course, because if it isn't, it might as well not have been done. Um, and it's never been easier to do that than it is now. Uh, you know, you've got email. Um, I know, you know, agents that do things with, uh, with texts now as well. Whatever it is, you know, if there's a written record of it, that's golden for you. So when you see issues like these, you know, what's a good thing to do? Uh, Fire off an email to the other side and say, or fire off an email to your client and say, hey, you know, I, I noticed this stuff. Can you give me some information? You know, tell me when's the last time you had a repair done on this, things like that. Yeah. Well, the, the problem is people don't turn in their emails to the office, although they're certainly invited to do so. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm suggesting maybe they ask the questions, they put the, que the answers on the app. Yeah. That uh, also very good. I mean, if you if you've asked a question and you've gotten a response back from the other side or from the seller, if you're representing the seller, um, a good idea to put that stuff in whatever disclosure form you're using. Most everybody's using the Abbott. Um, also, something to do that will be very valuable for you in almost any situation is this: when you ask the seller questions, you know, have you uh, have you had any any leaks? Have you had any recent repairs? And the you know the, whatever the answer is that comes back, tell the buyer the answer, but also tell them the source of the answer. That brings you under the protection of a case called Robinson versus Grossman, which is a case that I pretty much cite in every single brokerage defense case that I do. It's a great case. Um, but if you disclose the source of that information, it takes it. So you're not the owner of that information. Um, the Robinson case involved cracks in, a, in, a, uh, in the, the side of a, of a big stucco house in the town that I now live in, Poway, in San Diego. 
And the buyer had a question about it. He said, what's up with all these cracks? And the agent said, you know, I don't know. I'll check with the seller. And the seller said, oh, they're just, they're just stucco cracks, you know, you know common. Uh, you see them in stucco all the time. Um, they probably, the stucco was just mixed with, you know, not enough water or something like that. Hairline cracks, paint over it with uh, elastomeric paint, you'll be fine. Um, so the agent uh, actually uh, puts that in the disclosure and says, you know, per the seller, these are superficial cosmetic hairline cracks, likely, you know, caused by improper mixture of the stucco. Um, seller says, you know, we use elastomeric paint, blah, 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 blah. I have not verified this. And that was a, that was a good thing. The seller, the, the listing agent said, you know, this is information coming from the seller. I'm not, this isn't me telling you this. I haven't, you know, done this investigation and verified it myself. I'm just telling you what the seller is telling me. Turns out that information was not true. There was a huge geotechnical problem that they discovered when they started excavating for a pool. The excavation collapsed and damaged the house. The geotechnical guys came in and said, well, yeah, there were telltale signs all over the place. I mean, look at all the cracks on the side of the house. Um, what got the agent out of that lawsuit was the fact that they didn't own that disclosure. They said, this is coming from the seller. I don't know the, I don't know the, the answer to this, but this is what the seller says. Jack. Okay, on the SPQ, a lot of these things are, are, are asked. Mm -hmm. So if we notice that they haven't addressed them on the SPQ, then we should go further, or should we just take what they have signed, is said and signed on the SPQ? It talks about re recent leaks, it talks about recent repairs, recent pain. Right. Um, if you see something on the SPQ where the seller, had, whether you're representing the seller or you're representing the buyer, if, the, if there's a portion of the SPQ that's not completed, make sure it gets completed. That's one of the big uh, you know, issues of falling below the standard of care is letting a, 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 a document like the SBQ slip through without um, being fully filled out. I've had a number of cases where that's been the gripe that the standard of care expert, the judge, have had with the agents is this question, you know, dealt specifically with the issue the buyer is now having. It wasn't circled, there was nothing, you know, no information given about it. How come nobody went back to the seller and said, hey, you know, give us some information on this. Yeah, so if you see something on the SPQ that's not filled out, make sure the seller fills it out. Yes. Yeah, it was kind of off Jack's statement, but okay. based on the fact that these things have been, in most cases, probably marked as no's on the SPQ by the seller, you know, how far do we take that responsibility on? Well, it, it, you are not tasked with, um, you know, proving that your sellers are, you know, not telling the truth or whatever. So, I mean, if the seller has filled the SPQ out, and remember, the SPQ isn't, you know, doesn't say, no, these problems don't exist. It says, seller, are you aware of any of these problems? So, um, if the seller fills out the SPQ and everything is circled, checked, whatever it is, it's, it's fully filled out, and there's no red flag of any situation, there's not much else you can really do. I mean, at some point, you, you've got to move the transaction along. What you need to look out for are, you know, are there red flags? You know, if the seller says, uh, no, we haven't had any uh, recent repairs or roof leaks, and you see evidence of repairs and roof leaks, then, you know, you've got to go the next step and ask the question, well, what, you know, tell me why, when you check the box, no, or you didn't check the box at all, why do we see this stuff? And, the, you know, the answer may be, I didn't do that. I haven't lived here that long. It's not my repair. You know, the, the question is, did I do anything? And, and no, you know, the answer is no, I didn't. And, and that's, I mean, that's a perfectly acceptable answer. You just need to, you know, to flesh that out and follow, you know, connect the dots on that stuff. Um, Andy, let's uh, hit the next slide. Okay. So, you know, let's just go through all of them. All right. So, this is, this is the, the most common thing that we see with uh, claims against listing agents. Most of the time, listing agents sit in the catbird seat because there's a lot of, of case law um, that, that is very friendly to them. Uh, that basically says, you know, you see an issue. If you're a listing agent and you see the stain on the ceiling, all you say is there's a stain in the ceiling in you know whatever room it is. If you feel a bump in the carpet, that's all you say. I felt the bump in the carpet. You don't have to go beyond that and talk about what the possible effects of a bump in the carpet or a stain in the ceiling are. The listing agents are incredibly well insulated on that. So, based on that. Where we see the claims come is by way, not so much of the buyers, but by way of the sellers who get dragged into these cases and say, oh, what, I was supposed to disclose that there was a, you know, a, a, a flood 
that occurred a couple of years ago and you know flooded the entire downstairs. Well, I didn't know that. Um, you didn't. You know, you, you didn't tell me I was supposed to disclose that. So here's the you know here's the way we, we often see it is the you know the ever popular. Well, you told me not to disclose it. In other words, it was the topic of discussion and. You know, the agent actually said, don't disclose it. Um, that's never a good idea, by the way. I mean, if anything you know, comes up as a topic of discussion, it's, I mean, if you have to ask the question, should I disclose this? The answer is almost always yes. Um, you know, you'll encounter sellers that will say, well, you know, that's going to cause me problems, blah, 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 blah. I've even seen sellers who have said, um, if you disclose this, I will sue you, uh, listing broker, because I'm going to get less from my property. I'd much rather defend that claim than I would defend the claim from the buyer who didn't get the disclosure. So anyway, we don't see a ton of these. We do see some of these. Uh, but the bottom line is, if anything ever pops up like that and the seller says, you know, don't disclose it or I don't want you to disclose it, no, you disclose it and then you know, follow it up with a writing to the, uh, to the seller. Yeah. On the issue of disclosure, and I don't know if it was you or another attorney, but, it's, but something bothered me about that conversation which took place here. And that is that that attorney said that it might be our obligation to go and interview neighbors near houses to find out if they believe that there's an issue that we don't know about. Huh. No, that's, okay. Uh, okay. that's a misinterpretation of when yes. it's previously listed and goes into escrow. Okay. You All right. that instance? <laughs> uh, I, I think I do uh, recall what you're, what you're talking about. Um, it, it, I, I wouldn't say that you have the obligation to, to go and talk to, to neighbors to find out information, but we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Right now, let's just talk about when you owe the fiduciary duty to the, to the buyer, a lot of things are in play. When you're a listing agent, you deal mostly with just what's in front of you and what the seller tells you. So Again, we don't see a lot of the you told me not to disclose it cases, but they do pop up a, a, a little bit. So if there is any possibility of that, you, you obviously want a lot of writing to protect you from a seller saying, hey, you told me I didn't have to disclose it. Um, you told me I didn't have to disclose it. Yeah, same kind of a thing. You know, that usually pops up with the repair type of a thing. You know, the seller says, oh, I, I, you know, I did a repair 10 years ago. Do I have to disclose it? Oh, well, uh, you, if you have any problems with it, uh, in the last 10 years, no, you don't have to disclose it. And, and, and quite frankly, the law is real murky on that. I mean, there are cases that say if something is repaired and there has been no problem with it, it's not a disclosure item. The problem is, how do you know there hasn't been a problem with it? So if the issue of a repair, a past repair comes up, it's always better to disclose it. Um, but this is the one that's, that's the most tricky. It's that you really didn't tell me anything either way. Um, and if you'd explain things better, I would have disclosed it. And I think where we're going to see more of this stuff, Andy, is with the DocuSign, the increased reliance on transaction coordinators and all that. We do see cases where sellers basically say, I didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, it's not that anybody told me I didn't have to disclose it or told me not to disclose it. I just got no information at all. I mean, I was emailed this, you know, file and I opened it. And you know when I clicked on it, my signature appeared on you know a bunch of documents, and no one really told me you know what I was supposed to disclose and what I wasn't supposed to disclose, and and that's that's a more difficult case, uh, you know, for me or for anybody uh, who's defending a broker to defend. I mean that that's a tough one, um, especially if we don't have something where we can um, independently sit down and, and and prove that no, we did you know the agent, the listing agent did go over the TDS. The listing agent did go over the disclosure obligations, things like that. If we don't have that, if we can't prove that, it becomes, uh, you know, these cases become much scarier. So, you know, as the technology, um, you know, gets, gets more advanced, as the ability to send, you know, uh, transaction documents uh, in various ways and click on them and get electronic signatures, as that technology becomes more useful, realize that it's not all about the technology because you know the law still is the law and the law still says you got to explain your dis you know the, the seller's disclosure obligations to the seller so at some point you know the conversation has to has to take place yes this I guess is addressed to Jim and Jack um, regarding DocuSign if we did explain the disclosures to our sellers and we went over them mm -hmm. are we allowed to DocuSign disclosures 
Well, I don't know how they get filled out on DocuSign. Yeah, they. Yeah, they have, they have to print them out, <coughs> and then and why wouldn't they just sign them after they printed them out yeah. and put the disclosure on there? Okay. Yeah, again, it's, it's not the technology that's that's the evil, you know, part of this. It's you know, is the personal touch still there? You know, is the is the information being given to the seller? You know, disclosure is really important. Um, you know, these are the things that you need to look for. Disclose to the buyer things that you would want to know if you were buying a property. So somehow that, that's got to be conveyed to them, whether it's, you know, in a sit-down meeting or it's, you know, an email that accompanies the DocuSign documents, whatever it is. Um, you know, th this, is, this has got to, you know, has got to go along with it. Um, one of the, the interesting things that I see pop up now with the REO market is I get a lot of uh, calls from clients that say, you know, we're representing the bank, or sometimes they're not representing the bank, they're representing the buyer, but the bank is basically saying, we don't have any disclosure obligations, we don't have to tell you anything about this property, uh, you know, California's law is we don't, we don't have to tell you anything. Um, and that's not true. You know, the, does anybody know what the disclosure obligation of an REO seller is in California? Exactly. Same as it is for any other seller. Disclose what you know about the property. Um, they're exempt from certain forms. They don't have to fill out a TDS. They don't have to fill out a TDSD. Um, but they do have to disclose what they know. And, you know, in the olden days, an REO seller may not have kept the property in the inventory for very long. You know, it gets bought up at the uh, foreclosure sale. It gets put on the market relatively quickly. And they don't learn much about the property. These days, that's not the case. Uh, you know, properties are staying in the REO inventory for a lot longer, sometimes, you know, a year or more. And they can learn things about the property during that time. Or you have a disgruntled seller, owner, whatever, that got foreclosed out and decides to write, you know, a 10-page letter on every single thing that's gone wrong with the property that, since the day that they owned it. And then, you know, uh, send it registered mail to the, uh, to the that's, I, uh, we, we have a case just like that right now. Um, and you know, Freddie Mac is the is the seller in that case, and Freddie Mac is getting sued because they got uh, a letter from their seller or their owner rather, uh, saying here's everything that's wrong with the property. Um, now, did that I mean they got it? What did they do with it? Who knows? We've been involved in the case for six months, and Freddie Mac still can cannot figure out that you know obviously they got it. Um, they, you know that that's been proven. But where that is, they have no idea. Uh, it never made it into their file, um, and obviously, it never it never made it to you know to the to our file, the broker's file. It never certainly made it to the, to the uh, buyer when they purchased the property. Um, but you know, of course, what happens? The, the buyers buy the property from Freddie Mac, move in, and who do you think knocks on the door a couple of uh, weeks later? Oh, hey, yeah, so uh, you're living here now. Yeah, I used to live here too. I think I lost in the foreclosure. I assume Freddie Mac gave you this letter that you know I sent uh, to them detailing uh, the wrong property. Oh, they didn't send this to you? Well, here I brought a copy. Why don't I just leave this? You know, with you. Uh, so. So that's something, yes. Uh, recently, as a buyer's agent, I would get five days before close of escrow disclosures from companies, whether it's short or remax or, you know, about mold and the buyer has to check and so forth. I, I understand the policy in our office is not to have our clients sign those disclosures if they're not CAR disclosures. But I would think I, would, I should forward <laughs> to the buyer uh, as something I got from the listing agent, even though we're closing in five days. Hmm. How, how would you? I mean, it's happening a lot, especially with, um, you know, a coordinator, uh, office coordinator or five uh -huh. coordinator say, oh, you missed this form. Can you please have it? Uh, I'll answer the I, question. I think, I think Jim has an answer for you. Yeah. <laughs> the answer to the question is you can provide the form to your client, but you can't ask them to sign it. You can advise them they can go to a lawyer and get advice if they want to sign it. We don't give professional opinions about other brokerages' forms because that's legal advice. Yeah, I, I think what, what Jim is saying is this. You know, when you are representing a buyer and all of a sudden a form gets presented to your buyer by this other agency and they say, your buyer has to sign this, you know, Nobody has to do anything in this world. <laughs> uh, there's a few things that you have to do, and where do you look to find out what your buyer has to do? The purchase agreement. Right, exactly. 
All your buyer has to do is comply with the terms of the purchase agreement. Now it's up to them if they want to sign these forms, but yeah, when, when another you know, brokerage comes to you and says you have to do this, well, look at the contract. Some brokerages are, are savvy enough to say, to put it in an addendum or something like that, that you know, buyer will execute you know, the following disclosure. And these aren't really disclosures, they're um, more along the lines of kind of informative uh, you know, papers. Um, but whatever it is, yeah, I mean, they don't, they don't have to do anything that's not in the contract, yeah. How does that uh, factor in with um, relocation companies? I don't know. What do you mean? Well, they may sign up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, You're not a uh, that's not. Okay. Uh, again, what you would want to do is you would want to look at the contract. Yes, if the contract says, they're typically contracts. Yeah. Those are typically part of a contract. Yeah. If the contract says a uh, buyer, you know, the what, what's going the way it's going to flesh out is you know you're going to write an offer, you're going to get a, a counter offer back from the listing broker saying you know, blah, 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 and buyer is going to execute the following documents. And if it's part of the contract, then yeah, the buyer either has to do it or, or they have to back out of the deal. It's the same thing as if you get some squirrely addendum on a new construction from a builder. You know, we don't, you don't tell your client to sign it. You tell your client, I don't know what the hell this thing means. You need to go see a lawyer. Otherwise, you're facilitating uh, the buyer giving away their rights. And then they come back later and they say, hey, you told me it was okay. And, and, and along those lines, that sort of phases into what, what, you know, where I was going to go next with this is there, there's certainly a misconception even among the REO uh, sellers as to what their disclosure duties are. And there's an even greater um, uh, misunderstanding amongst people who are buying these things, not they're not the REO lenders, but the, they are the people that are buying them at the foreclosure sale. I can't tell you how many times I have had to deal with some LLC or L, you know, whatever it is, uh, joint venture that says, we bought this at the foreclosure sale, and therefore, we have no disclosure duties. We don't have to give you a TDS, we don't give you an NHD, we're not signing an SPQ, we are not telling you anything about the property, so on and so forth. That's completely bogus. Just because you buy something at a foreclosure sale, if you're not the foreclosing trust deed holder, and you just happen to be an investor buyer who picks it up at the foreclosure sale, you have the same disclosure obligations that everybody else does. So if you are representing a buyer, and you are confronted with somebody who is saying, I don't, I don't know any disclosure duties, I'm not going to provide a TDS, I'm not going to provide an NHD, well, what do you do with that? Um, what you do is this. You, you go to your buyer and say, seller's not gonna provide you a TDS, they're not gonna provide you any disclosures. Um, they claim that they don't have to, um, we disagree, but the, you know, uh, ultimately it's up to you. Uh, do you wanna proceed with this without disclosures, or do you wanna back out of the deal, do you wanna go see a lawyer and talk to them about what your rights are, that kind of stuff. But when, if you encounter this type of stuff, um, realize it has to be dealt with. You know, you, you can't just say, oh, well, okay, they're, they're claiming they don't have the obligation to, to give us a TDS, so I guess we just won't do what we have to do, we'll get one and we'll close the deal. It's got to be, that's a red flag. It's got to be dealt with. Yeah. How does uh, obtaining after the fact permits fall on this, what you're talking about? I don't think I have to be, they say it's very common, I mean, I mean multiple times, uh, where somebody goes in and remodels their house or into the mm -hmm. kitchen or whatever. What liability is associated with the listing? Uh, you mean like an as-built permit? You didn't get it, but but yeah, then you go back in after remodeled and didn't get it. Mm -hmm. you, you tell them in the SPQ that, that the job home was done, remodeled was done without permit. If the uh, buyer gets full disclosure of the fact that it was done without permits, that issue is pretty much done. If it's fully disclosed, there's nothing they can do after the fact to come after you as a permit. And that would the obligation if they say we want you to get the permit. The buyer says and you get the permits after the fact or down. Well, we, we may want to talk a little bit about this afterwards because this is, that, it's, a, it's a longer longer issue than we it's probably have. It's an open escrow. Oh, is it? Yeah. All right. It's, it's trying nice. to get a little. Then, yeah. then we should definitely talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> yes? On the opposite side, but I know you probably aren't going to get to this, but on the dock sign for a buyer, mm -hmm. I mean, they're basically signing and saying they've read everything. I mean, mm -hmm. it, <laughs> how how can you fight that if they come back and say you didn't explain this? I mean, 
Yeah, so that's basically every buyer in every lawsuit I've ever been in uh, who has been confronted with, you know, well, you signed this, did you read it? Nope. But it says right here, you're acknowledging that you received and read it. Yep, I didn't read it, I don't know what to tell you, I didn't have the time. Uh, they told me it wasn't important. I guess it was important, I wish they told me it was important. That's what everybody says, and then they forget how to speak English. I mean, it's, uh, it's basically, <laughs> uh, buyers are, we become incredibly, uh, uh, again, use the technology as, as best you can, but don't forget that there is a personal side of this that still needs to be addressed. Um, and, you know, simply emailing something to somebody, having them sign it, and having a bold line at the bottom that says, this was very important and you certainly did read it, just isn't going to protect you. What's going to protect you is some sort of objective evidence that you can show that you actually sat down with them and went over, you know, if it's the seller, you went over the TDS and what the disclosure obligations are. If it's the buyer, you went over the red flags that you saw when you were, you know, investigating the property or you, you know, whatever red flags are addressed by the uh, uh, home inspection report or whatever it may be. You've got to have some evidence that you did that now. You know, if you want to get super technical on it, you could do it by Skype. I mean, you know, you okay. can DocuSign stuff and then set up a Skype, you know, uh, meeting or whatever. Somehow you've got to be able to show that you actually sat down and, and did this stuff. So if, if, if getting together in a room isn't isn't the way to do it, it's got to be done some way and. No, no, no. I just, yeah. I have a foreign buyer and I'm about to deal with this. So sure. Getting on the internet and face to face and explaining the form is as good as being in the same room then or as close? Pretty close. Okay. I don't know. You tell me. Do it. Let me know how it goes. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll expect a full report. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Let's. Uh, it's a burning email. You know, we met. Uh, those are great. Um, it, you know, uh, again, this is why I love email so much is because you can do this stuff and then you can jam out an email to somebody, you know, on your iPhone or your Droid or whatever it is. Hey, it was great meeting with you today, uh, you know, to go over the TDS, uh, you know, if you have any questions, please let me know what they were. Then at least you have some sort of, you know, way of saying, yeah, on this day we met, look, here's the confirming email. I didn't get an email back saying, what are you talking about? We didn't meet today. I don't know who you are. Uh, you know, if you don't get something like that, then I mean, that's a confirming letter. That's good. Um, let's, uh, let's jam over to the next slide. Okay, and there we go. Letters and emails. Um, this is the that that's the stuff that's important. Um, you know, if, if you're dealing with your seller, a, a good you know confirming email is you know I just want to let you know the TDS is included uh, included in this. Um, disclosure is really important, you know, big issue with, uh, with the buyers. Particularly important to disclose, you know, recent leaks, uh, repairs you've done to the property, that kind of stuff. It's those types of emails that will, or confirming letters, faxes, texts, whatever you want to do, uh, that will be invaluable to you if you have to, you know, prove later on what you did or didn't do. All right, let's go to the next one. Okay, so issues for selling agents. Um, this is where it becomes a little bit uh, a little bit more tricky because when you're the selling agent, you owe the fiduciary duty to the buyer. And there are cases that say, um, well, you owe the fiduciary duty to the buyer, the obligation is generally more than to simply disclose what the fact is. In the old uh, classic example of the listing agent's obligation to simply disclose the fact is Sweat versus Hollister. House was located in a hundred year floodplain. That was disclosed to the buyer. What wasn't disclosed to the buyer was the fact that if your house is built in a hundred year floodplain, it's a non conforming property, which means if it gets destroyed, you can't build it again. Well, that wasn't disclosed. Um, buyer's house gets destroyed, buyer finds out, hey, I now own a vacant lot in a hundred year floodplain. Uh, <coughs> not exactly what they wanted. So they sued, and the, and the court said, no, it, that was disclosed to you. It was, it's your obligation to go the next step and find out what is the, what is the ramification of, you know, when somebody tells you, oh, by the way, this house is in a 100-year floodplain, it's up to you now to take that baton and run down the track and find out, well, what does that mean? Um, it's not the, the seller or the seller or not agent's obligation to disclose that information to you. It gets a little trickier when you're representing the buyer. Turn that scenario on its head, and now you are representing the buyer, and you get that disclosure, 
Well, as the fiduciary, you probably have a duty to do something else. That, that's a red flag. You know, uh, walking into the backyard and seeing a crumbling slope in a house in Palos Verdes or seeing a retaining wall that's cantering, you know, down the hill, those are red flags. So, so what do you do? Um, let's take our Sweat versus Hollister issue. You know, what do you do if you're the selling agent and the listing agent and the seller say, house is in a 100-year floodplain? Do you then go out and research what the meaning of that is? and tell the buyer what the ramifications of that are and hope that you get it right? Well, that's one option for you. I would not suggest that as an option that you should pursue. Um, what I would pursue is, is I would do this. I would say, we've got a disclosure that the house is in a 100-year floodplain. I don't really know what that means. I think we better get you to somebody who does. Uh, you know, go, go talk to the building department, talk to a lawyer, talk to a contractor, an architect, somebody, and find out what that means. You know, let's take our scenario of, you know, we're at Palos Verdes and we're looking at a uh, retaining wall that's cantering down the hill. Well, what does that mean? Well, it could just mean you have a lousy retaining wall that needs to be rebuilt. could also mean you have slope creep. Uh, it could mean a whole lot of different things. Um, do you want to get out there with your pick and shovel and, you know, take a, a soil sample and run it over to the lab and try to analyze it? No, of course not. But what you want to say is, buyer, uh, I took a look at you know the house, and it looks like the retaining wall's got issues. Um, we want to address these. The person to talk to is probably you know a contractor or you know maybe a geotech or something like that. Let me know what you want to do. And of course, what every buyer is going to do is you know when when you say there's a you know, the retaining wall looks bad. Well, what should we do? Well, we should probably get a uh, you know a geotechnical guy out here. Great, let's do it. Okay. Here's the name of a geotechnical engineer. You know what it's going to cost you to get a soils test and a geotechnical evaluation of your retaining wall? About 7,500 bucks. At that point, most buyers are going to walk away from that issue, but at least you have addressed it. It's in your file. You, there's been a back and forth on it. The issue's been addressed. The buyer has made his, her, their choice on what to do. They had the opportunity to get it evaluated by a professional. They either did it and were satisfied or they didn't do it because it was too expensive or whatever, it was their choice to make. That's, that's how you address the red flag. So don't think that you have to all of a sudden be you know, experts on zoning and uh, uh, you know, geotechnical issues and, and all that stuff. No, what you have to do is just point these folks in the direction, you know, address the issue, highlight it, point them in the right direction and let them make their own decision. I think that was the end of our <laughs> of our slideshow. So uh, yes, um, I, I would like you to address the computer knowledge when we were talking about networking groups because I, I have some concern even about the agency. Okay. But when you have actually networking groups that are intra brokerage, I mean they're you know all these brokerage groups get together, they actually talk about things, and then where does your liability come if you ever have a problem? Hmm. That's a pretty wide-ranging question. <laughs> you get together and talk about things, where does the liability come from if you have a problem? I don't know. What are you talking about? What kind of problems are you having? Well, I mean, okay, so in a networking group, you find out something about the property. Okay. You find out if the South Bay Broker agent something about a property that somebody else has. Okay. And then somebody in South Bay Broker sells it, which I may not know about until after it's sold or I see it in the sales meeting and things like that. You know, is there any imputed knowledge that we should have had about that property? Soils or you know. yeah, I mean, I mean, if you if you want to just take a dry legal look at that, yeah, if you're if you're sitting in a networking group and somebody <coughs> says to you, "Wow, I've got a listing over on you know ABC Street, Palos Verdes, and we just got a geotechnical report, and the place is just you know it's it's about ready to fall down the hill." <coughs> that's information that that you now have. Now you don't know whether that information is true or not. Obviously, uh, you're you're getting that information from somebody else. So that's secondhand information, <coughs> but it's nevertheless information that you have. So technically, is that information that everybody you know in the room now has? Well, yeah, technically it is. Um, so you know. But so that's the sort of the dry way of just reading the law on it. Now, as a practical, uh, um, you know, turning to the practical side of this, if South Bay Brokers brings in the buyer on that property, and for some reason the information that was disclosed to you in this networking group, group doesn't make it its way to the buyer, is there a way for 
somebody to say, well, you knew about it, therefore the list selling agent knew about it, uh, therefore South Bay is liable. I, I suppose that's a legal argument. Um, how they would ever find out about that, I, I have no idea. Uh, and that's where the practical you know, issue comes in. But, I mean, if you were to learn something really significant about that property and then you find out that somebody else in the, in the brokerage is dealing with that property, yeah, it's probably a good idea for the two of you to talk and say, you know, this is what I found out as part of my networking group. You may wanna, you may wanna check this out. That's what I would do. Jim? So, what, what do you, uh, do you have a recommendation on if you get a, the listing is listed by another brokerage and it goes into escrow and out of escrow and then you get the listing, lucky you. Right. Um, what's prudent there? <laughs> well, that's a, that's a very interesting question, Jim. I, I, I wonder where, uh, where, that, where that question comes out of. Um, the, that, that was actually a case uh, that, uh, that, I, that I worked on at one point. Um, yeah, so you, you, you come in as, uh, we, 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 I'll just tell you what, at white, at, at white and Bright, what we call that, um, the second agent, we just refer to them as the Patsy because that's pretty much what they are in almost every instance. When somebody lists the property you know, for a few months and then there's an escrow and that escrow falls out and then the seller comes to you and says, uh, yeah, I'd like, to, I'd like you to list the property now. Really, why is that? Is it because the former agent learns something about the property that you don't want to disclose to whatever the new buyer is? That's exactly the case that, that Jim is talking about. Um, yeah, so what happens when you are the patsy, when the seller comes to you and says, hey, I'd like you to take over the listing from, from so-and-so? Um, here's where we get down to what's prudent and what's the standard of care. Um, does the standard of care say that you need to go call up the listing agent, uh, the previous listing agent, and say, I'm taking over your listing, or whatever, or I, I'm taking the listing, the seller's now come to me. Um, I'd like to know about that previous escrow. Do you have any you know, information with something that you learned something about the property uh, during that escrow that you can tell me about, so on and so forth? Um, so does a standard of care require that? I don't know. Um, probably not right now, but it might in the future. So anytime you're looking at something saying it might happen in the future, the odds are you should probably think about doing it. Now, realistically, what's going to happen if you call the former listing agent up and say, I'd like to know everything about your listing and what happened in that transaction, um, and I'd like to see your file or whatever, they're probably, A, not going to return your call, um, or B, if you do get them on the phone, they're probably going to say, you know what, it's not really our, our brokerage policy to um, you know, release the file on something like that. You know, uh, we, we just can't do it. Um, so if, if that's the case, you know, obviously you want to talk to your seller about that as well. So you were, you know, you were in another escrow, and that escrow was unsuccessful. Why? What happened? Were there any reports that were generated? Um, you know, did, did, did anybody take a look at the property? Was there a home inspection? Was there a geologist? Was there a geotech? Was there a forensic architect that looked at anything? I throw these all out there because they were part of the case. Um, and, you know, and then and then get the information, and then uh, and then verify it. I mean, if the seller says no, 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 nothing like that. Uh, the buyer, we just couldn't come to terms on the price, or the buyer's financing fell through. They you know got transferred to the East Coast and just you know, didn't want to go through with the transaction, or whatever. Great. Um, there's your confirming email to to your seller. Uh, you know, great talking to you today, Bob. Um, just so we're clear on that previous escrow, you know, that fell out uh, not because of a physical condition related to the house, but you know, because of a you know an unrelated issue with the buyer's financing or something like that. You know, if, if, if you know, jog your memory. If there were any reports, you know, please provide them to us. Um, something like that. It's, it's, you know, is it the standard of care to do that now? Probably not. Is it good practice to do it? Yes. And if it's good practice to do it, it probably will be the standard of care in, you know, two years, three years, five years down the road. So something to start thinking about. All right. I think I've gone. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you.